Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello, it's good to see you all today. Uh, we have our special guest, John Mariani, the virtual gourmet, and of course, my terrific partner, John Coleman. How are you doing, guys? Doing good. Well, thank you. John Mariani, a man who um, knows all about the best food and drink in the world. You might be the ultimate James Bond aficionado, are you? Uh, among many, many, many out there, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. My whole life as a food, wine, and travel writer uh, really had its instigation when I saw the first Bond movie at the age of about 18 or something, a very impressionable moment, and uh, a whole lot of other guys I knew said, hmm, that's, that's a unique kind of individual um, who drove great cars, made love to great women, um, yep. had his way with a gun, uh, was uh, a witty, but also uh, used as part of his persona, his persuasiveness, and his ability to get out of trouble, his knowledge of food, wine, and he knew how to travel. He was a, a British agent, uh, schooled in British gentility, and he knew how to check into a hotel, and he had his tailor, and he had uh, he bought uh, exactly what he liked and, and nothing else on um, German Street in London for his breakfast. And it was very persuasive because um, he was a, this complete new hero. If you think of all the American film heroes, just about all of them, before James Bond, <clears throat> they were guys like Humphrey Bogart, who drank scotch. They were guys like John Garfield, who would only eat the steak. These are tough guys. The people who ate, who drank um, uh, martinis, except for the thin man, William Powell, the, the people who drank martinis, the people who drank cognac, were usually um, people who were Nazi commandants who were about to seduce <laughs> or co rape the uh, blonde uh, American woman or, or Joan Crawford or whomever, um, people who were fancy gourmets who uh, poured over their food and drink uh, and uh, ordered special labels. These are always, you know, effeminate, sort of, um, yeah. wicked, too indulgent, decadent. And that was, I mean, anybody from Humphrey Bogart and Gary Cooper through... Um, Clark Gable are not guys who went around ordering a martini shaken, not stirred. And then Bond comes along, who is not American, so you would think, well, maybe we shouldn't really respond to this guy as much as we do to Bogart um, or Clint Eastwood or, or someone. Um, you know, uh, Clint Eastwood only drinks tequila when he's in Mexico killing Mexicans. Um, but Bond was a, uh, uh, he wasn't a gourmand, because you have to go back to the books, all of which I've read. Ian Fleming wrote those books during the Cold War in the 1950s. Um, Ian Fleming was himself <clears throat> somebody who liked good food and wine. He had his club in London. He had his place in Jamaica. Noel Coward said that Ian Fleming himself was a filthy cook, terrible cook. Um, but he used to put all of these things into uh, his, his novels about James Bond. So when James Bond went to Japan in You Only Live Twice, um, Taiga Tanaka, his uh, his colleague over there, shows him how to drink sake and to eat fugu. And when he goes to Greece, uh, he <clears throat> learns how to uh, drink Greek wines, or actually Spurns drinks wine. And when he's even with M, his own superior, when M in the books offers him a specific uh, wonderful Chateau Margaux, 1945, uh, Bond even sniffs that and says, I'd really have, prefer to have some Tetinger Blanc de Blanc champagne. Um, and even when he was with Dr. No, who was about to torture and kill him, invites Bond to dinner and offers him a wine. And uh, Bond says, well, I prefer the uh, 53 to the uh, 45. It's, it, it was remarkable stuff that he <laughs> pulled off. Um, it helped him, uh, uh, it helped him it rid himself of enemies when once he was on an ocean liner in uh, Diamonds Are Forever, and he ordered up a, um, a Bordeaux, a red Bordeaux, a claret, a claret. Um, <laughs> and the uh, waiter comes up, who's a bad guy, this guy is a waiter, and uh, James Bond is suspicious of the guy, so um, he said, but I ordered a claret, and he says, we were out of claret, 
well, of course, he knew right away that this jerk was not really a waiter. And Bond tosses him overboard into the, into the ocean and makes love to um, one of his oddly named uh, girlfriends. So this was very oppressive stuff on screen and um, somewhat also on on um, in the books. Uh, cause he's a good writer. They're very good spy spy novels. Uh, and uh, he, he once Bond once said, I want a woman who can make love and make a great Bernays sauce. Well. Humphrey Bogart didn't go around saying that sort of thing. Uh, but Bond could not only get away with it, but had such insouciance that everybody wanted to be Bond. Women wanted to make love to Bond. Men wanted to drive cars and, and shoot guns and dispatch enemies like Bond. And um, it was also mirrored in every issue of Playboy uh, magazine and uh, Esquire magazine. They, they fought over who was going to get the next cover of the next James Bond um, uh, a movie, um, the back and forth uh, cover. And um, Playboy play, uh, uh, published some of the later Ian Fleming stories. Um, but Playboy and Esquire are building on this legacy of, we publish a magazine for gentlemen. Now, gentlemen may like to ogle centerfolds of naked women, but they also like to invite them up to their room with their cool new stereo, flip on some Miles Davis and say, have some Madeira, my dear. Yeah. Remember that awful song? <laughs> uh, and James Bond f fed into and made this flair to such a degree that when he ordered in the first um, first James Bond uh, movie, when he ordered uh, Tattinger and there was the Dom Perignon, the sales of the great marks of champagne, which are the most expensive champagnes, the only ones any American has ever heard of is Moet, you know, um, Moet Chandon, uh, Moet uh, uh, Red Stripe, whatever, Red Stripe. And um, nobody in America drank champagne, Tattinger and Bollinger and so forth. So the champagne company started to pay the producers to have him drink and even hold up to the camera or order on the phone, send up a bottle, send up a bottle of Bollinger RD. And in, in one of them, um, I think it was on Our Majesty's Secret Service, Bond is covered in an avalanche. And a, a, a great, what do you call it, uh, St. Bernard comes with a keg of whiskey under him. And he licks Bond's face. And Bond restores himself by taking a sip of the, uh, the brandy in, in the uh, barrel there over the, on the St. Bernard's neck. And he says, ah, oh, thank you, old boy, but I do wish it had been Hennessy's. <laughs> you know, yeah. all that. and of course Aston Martin didn't have to Aston Martin was a, a, a mark of a, a car that uh, very few Americans or anybody had ever heard of before that but that became the coolest car in the world yeah so yeah, yeah not a lot except for being tortured I wanted to do everything else that James Bond did yeah James it, it, Fleming first with the book because they were extremely popular uh, really changed what it means to be a, a, a tough guy, a man, the yeah. manly tough guy, you know, that kind of thing. Well, um, there, there, had been, there had been in fiction, even in American fiction, a couple of very suave uh, gentlemen, uh, Leslie <clears throat> Charteris as the saint. He knew his way around a drawing room. Um, as I said, uh, the, in the Thin Man series, um, uh, Rick, Nick, and, and Nora, um, or the last name, Nick and Charles. Um, they're, they're full of this serving uh, martinis at, at parties, or so they call it ammunition, and it comes out of ammunition, you know, with a bunch of martinis. So they were very suave and genteel. And um, th there were several others along those lines. The, uh, the Hawk and uh, Nero Wolf was a connoisseur, um, Perry Mason to a certain extent. So it was not unknown, but when you think about those guys, like the Perry Mason and so forth, they were they were kind of a feat. They often had a British accent or a fake British accent, whereas James Bond was the real deal. And those other guys I just mentioned didn't kill a lot of people, and they weren't very strong. They didn't beat up guys and so forth. Do you think, uh, John, do you think that the movies... Um, I mean, let's face it, Covey Broccoli was not against uh, taking a couple of bucks to uh, to place a product in the movie, as you pointed out. Do you think the movies changed um, the hero? Because after all, Bond was a was a British hero. 
He was a British uh, product, if you will, uh, of M Ian Fleming. And, and prior to that, um, Amer I don't think American movies had a hero quite like him. No, there was nobody who was the complete pack. Remember, this was the Cold War. The Cold War continued well into the 60s and 70s. So it was nice to have a uh, guy who could vanquish all of these bad guys. Um, the, the American spy movies, <clears throat> which came out of World War II, in which you had guys like uh, Bogart and Jimmy Cagney and all the people you'd think from Clark Gable fighting Nazis, they had to be all American, pure-bred American tough guys who if they socked the Nazi in the nose, he stayed socked, you know. Um, and uh, James Bond was not, a, not above playing dirty when in Goldfinger, he plays Goldfinger and um, Bond picks up his um, Goldfinger's uh, golf ball and puts it in his pocket. So that when, in the last hole, when Goldfinger sinks a putt, um, Bond reaches down and says, uh, Goldfinger, don't you play a Titleist three, which he had in his pocket. <laughs> anyway, so he lost, he lost the match. So um, Bond was very, very tricky that way. But uh, yeah, we had well, there were precedents, but um, even even some British spy precedents in some Graham Greene movies. Uh, certainly, um, uh, Rex Harrison played a very suave. But Bond was just that he looked different. He was tall, and he didn't look he didn't look like Trevor Howard, and he didn't look like Rex Harrison. He looked like he could really beat the hell out of you, and often did. Or if he couldn't beat you because of your size, he would find a way to take an electrical outlet and put it against a uh, something metal, and uh, an odd job would touch it and be electrocuted. So he, he, had, he was very canny, very canny. I wanted to be canny, too. <laughs> had, you, uh, had you been, uh, had you read all the Bond books, the Ian Fleming books, uh, in your youth or before you saw the Bond movie? Which came first, movie or books? The movies came first, uh, then the books. And I, even up to a certain extent, they've kind of petered out by now. After Ian Fleming died, they realized they had a, a real great series on their hands. So they had various authors of uh, various talents continue. I wrote, read a few of those, but they just didn't have the same je ne sais quoi as uh, the Fleming books had. And the the, the original Bond movies, um, Dr. No, Goldfinger, Moonraker, Thunderball, and none of them pretty much followed... Um, the Ian Fleming novels. And one of the reasons why old geezers like ourselves like the early ones was they were far more dramatic, far more character-driven. Um, mm -hmm. Today, all the Bond movies, starting with, I guess, around Moonraker or, or something, started to get spectacular and go into outer space and always now with the, the Daniel Craig's blowing up half the world. I mean, he blew, he literally, in, in, in the first one, Casino Royale, Daniel Craig destroyed all of Venice, Italy. You know, buildings yeah. falling down on top of me. That's, you don't find that in uh, Dr. No or, uh, or um, Thunderball. Well, I have to say that um, uh, if it wasn't obvious uh, from the uh, dozens of episodes we've done with you before, that uh, uh, it is now should be extremely obvious of why when we want to know something about uh, Food, we go to our virtual gourmet, Mariani, John Mariani. Could you say that for us uh, in just that way? Yes, my name is John. No, how does he say that? Bon <laughs> Last name first. <laughs> this is Mariani. John Mariani, who, when identifying myself as a British spy, is telling you, I'm a British spy, by the way. And every bartender in the world seems to know. Oh, it's James Bond just walked in. He's going to ask him if he wanted uh, shaken or not stirred. So he doesn't exactly... <laughs> he pretends to be, he has these cards saying, international businessman or something. And uh, people look at the card, they say, yeah, we know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> Incognito, he was natto. <laughs> John, this has been fun. Thank you. Me too. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.